September 18, Rebuilding the Wall of Jerusalem Then Eliashib the high priest and the other priests started to rebuild at the Sheep Gate. They dedicated it and set up its doors, building the wall as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and the Tower of Hananel. People from the town of Jericho worked next to them, and beyond them was Zechur son of Imri. The fish gate was built by the sons of Hassaneah. They laid the beams, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Merimoth, son of Uriah and grandson of Hakaz, repaired the next section of wall. Beside him were Meshulam, son of Berechiah and grandson of Meshazabel, and then Zadok, son of Bana. Next were the people of Tekoa, though their leaders refused to work with the construction supervisors. The old city gate was repaired by Joida, son of Paseah, and Meshulam, son of Besedea. They laid the beams, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Next to them were Melatiah from Gibeon, Jadon from Maranoth, people from Gibeon, and people from Mizpah, the headquarters of the governor of the province west of the Euphrates River. Next was Uziel, son of Harhea, a goldsmith by trade, who also worked on the wall. Beyond him was Hananiah, a manufacturer of perfumes. They left out a section of Jerusalem as they built the broad wall. Rephaiah, son of Hur, the leader of half the district of Jerusalem, was next to them on the wall. Next, Judea, son of Haramaph, repaired the wall across from his own house, and next to him was Hadush, son of Hashabniah. Then came Melchijah, son of Hiram, and Hashub, son of Peath Moab, who repaired another section of the wall and the tower of the ovens. Shalom, son of Halahesh, and his daughters repaired the next section. He was the leader of the other half of the district of Jerusalem. The valley gate was repaired by the people from Zenoa, led by Hanan. They set up its doors and installed its bolts and bars. They also repaired the 1,500 feet of wall to the Dung Gate. The Dung Gate was repaired by Melchijah, son of Rechab, the leader of the Beth Hakarim district. He rebuilt it, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. The Fountain Gate was repaired by Shalom, son of Kolhosa, the leader of the Mizpah district. He rebuilt it, roofed it, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Then he repaired the wall of the Pool of Siloam near the king's garden, and he rebuilt the wall as far as the stairs that descend from the city of David. Next to him was Nehemiah, son of Azbuk, the leader of half the district of Beth-Zur. He rebuilt the wall from a place across from the tombs of David's family as far as the water reservoir and the house of the warriors. Next to him, repairs were made by a group of Levites working under the supervision of Rehum, son of Benai. Then came Hashabiah, the leader of half the district of Keilah, who supervised the building of the wall on behalf of his own district. Next, down the line, were his countrymen, led by Benui, son of Henadad, the leader of the other half of the district of Keilah. Next to them, Ezer, son of Jeshua, the leader of Mizpah, repaired another section of wall across from the ascent to the armory near the angle in the wall. Next to him was Baruch, son of Zabai, who zealously repaired an additional section from the angle to the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. Merimoth, son of Uriah and grandson of Hakkas, rebuilt another section of the wall extending from the door of Eliashib's house to the end of the house. The next repairs were made by the priests from the surrounding region. After them, Benjamin and Hashub repaired the section across from their house, and Azariah, son of Maaseah and grandson of Ananiah, repaired the section across from his house. Next was Benui, son of Henadad, who rebuilt another section of the wall from Azariah's house to the angle and the corner. Palal, son of Uzai, carried on the work from a point opposite the angle and the tower that projects up from the king's upper house beside the court of the guard. Next to him were Pedaiah, son of Perosh, with the temple servants living on the hill of Ophel, who repaired the wall as far as a point across from the water gate to the east and the projecting tower. Then came the people of Tekoa, who repaired another section across from the great projecting tower and over to the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priests repaired the wall. Each one repaired the section immediately across from his own house. Next, Zadok, son of Immer, also rebuilt the wall across from his own house, and beyond him was Shimeah, son of Shechaniah, the gatekeeper of the east gate. Next, Hananiah, son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zalaph, repaired another section, while Meshulam, son of Berechiah, rebuilt the wall across from where he lived. 
Melchizedek, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the wall as far as the housing for the temple servants and merchants, across from the inspection gate. Then he continued as far as the upper room at the corner. The other goldsmiths and merchants repaired the wall from that corner to the sheep gate. Enemies oppose the rebuilding. Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian army officers, What does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, remarked, That stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. Then I prayed, Hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. At last, the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired, and there is so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, Before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, They will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then, as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah, who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and officials and all the people, The work is very spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding. Then our God will fight for us. We worked early and late, from sunrise to sunset, and half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. That way, they and their servants could help with guard duty at night and work during the day. During this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me, ever took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. Nehemiah Defends the Oppressed About this time, some of the men and their wives raised a cry of protest against their fellow Jews. They were saying, we have such large families, we need more food to survive. Others said, we have mortgaged our fields, vineyards, and homes to get food during the famine. And others said, we have had to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay our taxes. We belong to the same family as those who are wealthy, and our children are just like theirs. Yet we must sell our children into slavery just to get enough money to live. We have already sold some of our daughters, and we are helpless to do anything about it, for our fields and vineyards are already mortgaged to others. When I heard their complaints, I was very angry. After thinking it over, I spoke out against these nobles and officials. I told them, you are hurting your own relatives by charging interest when they borrow money. Then I called a public meeting to deal with the problem. At the meeting, I said to them, 
We are doing all we can to redeem our Jewish relatives who have had to sell themselves to pagan foreigners. But you are selling them back into slavery again. How often must we redeem them? And they had nothing to say in their defense. Then I pressed further. What you are doing is not right. Should you not walk in the fear of our God in order to avoid being mocked by enemy nations? I myself, as well as my brothers and my workers, have been lending the people money and grain. But now let us stop this business of charging interest. You must restore their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and homes to them this very day, and repay the interest you charge when you lent them money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. They replied, We will give back everything and demand nothing more from the people. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and made the nobles and officials swear to do what they had promised. I shook out the folds of my robe and said, If you fail to keep your promise, may God shake you like this from your homes and from your property. The whole assembly responded, Amen. And they praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Continued Opposition to Rebuilding Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors in the gates. So Sanballat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me, so I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. The fifth time, Sanballat's servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. There is a rumor among the surrounding nations, and Geshem tells me it is true, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you, Look, there is a king in Judah. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king, so I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. I replied, There is no truth in any part of your story. You are making up the whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. Later, I went to visit Shimea, son of Delea, and grandson of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home. He said, Let us meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the door shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. But I replied, Should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I won't do it. I realized that God had not spoken to him, but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. Then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. Remember, O oh my God, all the evil things that Tobiah and Sanballat have done. And remember Noadiah the prophet and all the prophets like her who have tried to intimidate me. The builders complete the wall. So on October 2, the wall was finished, just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. During those 52 days, many letters went back and forth between Tobiah and the nobles of Judah. For many in Judah had sworn allegiance to him because his father-in-law was Shechaniah, son of Era, and his son Jehohanan was married to the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. They kept telling me about Tobiah's good deeds, and then they told him everything I said. And Tobiah kept sending threatening letters to intimidate me. After the wall was finished and I had set up the doors and the gates, the gatekeepers, singers, and Levites were appointed. I gave the responsibility of governing Jerusalem to my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the fortress, for he was a faithful man who feared God more than most. I said to them, Do not leave the gates open during the hottest part of the day, and even while the gatekeepers are on duty, have them shut and bar the doors. Appoint the residents of Jerusalem to act as guards, everyone on a regular watch. Some will serve at sentry posts and some in front of their own homes.